You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 28th of September 1998. Tonight we've got Raw in Detroit, Michigan, while Nitro's live from Rochester, New York. WWF Breakdown just took place the night before these shows and there's some confusion over who currently holds the WWF Championship, so maybe we'll get some answers tonight from Vince McMahon. This week's Jam Up Guy is Sam Donnelly, also from Detroit. Sam, a fan of old Chinese proverbs, dropped £50 by working out at the gym, so well done Sam, looking good my dude. Those cut off sleeves look great for showing off the 24 inch pythons brother, so keep up the good work. Right, here we go, our number one of Monday Nitro. Hollywood Hogan in the NWO come out to cut a promo to begin Monday Nitro. He says the folks in the audience who don't have their black and white shirts on need to remember something. Hollywood made wrestling. He took WCW, a stinking hillbilly promotion, and he made arenas like the one he's standing in now generate hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue. He calls the fans dumb, he calls the boys in the back dumb, he says Warrior running away from Hollywood has only delayed the pain and torture that's gonna happen at Halloween Havoc, and then Hogan says he went to the hood. That's right, he says, and I quote, he went to the hood and the brothers and sisters told him to do it for them. Hogan should take out his enemies one at a time for the hood. And they also referred to him as Wood, not Hollywood just wood. You couldn't make this up. Hogan says Sting and Brett are no good crybabies. And I challenge both of them. If they both want a piece of wood, I'll take them right in the center of the ring and rip them apart. Both of them. Hogan then says Sting and Brett will be the first victims of the wood regime. Serious. He then says, <laughs> you know what, just listen. If you're real tight with the wood master like the Nitro girls are, Woodmaster. Hulk Woodmaster Hogan. He's not done yet. You can just go ahead and call me Woody because I'm just too sweet. Ho Hollywoody Hulk Hogan. I give up. The Parker wrestled Super Kolo in our first match. I always thought the Parker was featured way more in WCW, but apparently not. Maybe he gets a few more matches before the end of 1998. Super Kolo tried valiantly to stop the chairman of WCW, but he struggled to come back following an Alabama slam. The Parker wins with a corkscrew moonsault, and then Super Kolo attacked the Parker with his own chair. I'd say this looks like a heel turn, but chances are it'll be forgotten about in a few weeks time. US champion Bret Hart comes out next to talk with Mean Gene and Bret confirms that he and Sting have accepted the challenge. That's right, Bret Hart's gonna wrestle Hulk Hogan tonight on Nitro, a match that many wanted to see in WWF. Bret says he and Sting agreed that Bret will get the first shot against Hollywood and if there's anything left, Sting can feast on the carcass. Bret says this has been building for years, Hogan's hid from his excellency, but tonight Bret wants one more chance to be a hero and make Hogan pay. He's gonna do it for everyone in the arena tonight. Hart can be as great as Flair and as great as Sting, and he's gonna do it by kicking the crop out of Woodmaster Hulk Hogan. The Booty Man then took on Sick Boy in a one on one match. If Booty Man wins, he gets to make a withdrawal from the dank bank of the Ultimate Warrior. Sick Boy was determined to beat Mr. Leslie, but Ed started no selling moves. It started with a suplex, and then it happened again after a neckbreaker. Booty Man then pulled off a big boot, and he manages to pull off the chartbuster, and Disciple wins on Monday Nitro. Not sure how the higher ups in WCW thought the crowd was gonna react here, but they reacted just as you'd expect them to. Nobody cared. The commentators are all hyped up about this Bret Hart vs Hulk Hogan match happening in the main event. They also announced that Rick vs Scott Steiner at Halloween Havoc will be a no disqualification match just before Scotty beats up two guys in the middle of the ring, Nick Dinsmore and Lenny Lane. It went down the exact same way as last week, only this time it looks like Scott Steiner injured himself while applying the Steiner recliner. He favours his lower back, so you know where this is headed. 
Warrior then cuts a brief promo. He says ever since he came to WCW, Hogan's brought nothing before him but a pittance of the man he once knew. A fan then tries to get in the ring and Warrior says this guy's a disappointment, he's a lost warrior. Imagine getting dragged out by security while Warrior calls you a disappointment. Hard times daddy, hard times. Warrior says that Hogan sees a small piece of what he used to be when he looks at the ultimate one. Warrior refuses to travel down the path Hogan did and be less than what he was and less than what he currently is and Hogan's gonna face the ultimate challenge for the second time in his life very soon. Warrior wants to feel the power and yeah, an improvement over previous promos in my opinion. Can't believe the OWN revolution was just getting booty man high as a kite though. Buff Bagwell came out to give the fans an update on Scott Steiner. Scotty's on his way to the hospital and Buff isn't too amused at Mean Gene implying that he's a liar. Buff says that Scott's hurt, the Halloween Havoc match may not happen and people are just gonna have to deal with it. That weird laugh that we've been hearing on Nitro recently interrupted Bagwell during this promo. Have a listen. We resolve this match <laughs> at Halloween ha <laughs> What is that? What is that? Vince McMahon opens up Raw with a promo while Ernest Miller takes on Psychosis on Nitro. Steve Austin's music plays in the arena but Vince McMahon walks out holding the smoking skull belt. McMahon's got a big entourage with him tonight and he's got a lot of security. And he says the next time he guarantees something he bets that people are gonna listen. Austin could have done this the easy way. All Vince wanted was for Stone Cold to follow direction but that didn't happen. So we're doing things the Vince McMahon way now and there will be no rematch for Stone Cold. With that in mind, Vince says there's no hard feelings, the WWF are going to celebrate Steve Austin so he declares the night Stone Cold Steve Austin night. McMahon even has a welcoming committee for Steve when he arrives to the building and McMahon hopes Austin can come along to see a new WWF champion get crowned tonight in the middle of the ring. Vince says the smoking skull belt's getting retired, it's gonna sit on his mantelpiece along with all his other awards and trophies, and the official WWF belt is gonna get bestowed on an unnamed individual a little later on. Sergeant Slaughter puts the belt around McMahon's waist as the crowd boos, so let's see who the champion's gonna be a little later on on Raw. On Nitro, Miller gives Psychosis the usual choice. Ernest is required by law to say he's a three-time karate champion and he'll give Psychosis five seconds to leave the ring or he'll get his ass kicked. Psychosis refuses the offer, so Miller hits a sidekick and he shows off after hitting a few strikes in the corner. Psychosis tries to come back with a low dropkick and when it goes to the outside he hits a diving crossbody. Back in the ring, Miller takes a missile dropkick and Mickey J is able to talk Psychosis into not hitting Miller with a top rope superplex. It's a bit odd. Psychosis applies a head scissor submission but Miller's able to counter a spinning wheel kick with a slam. Miller also counters a sunset flip attempt with a few mounted strikes and Psychosis fails to land his top rope leg drop. So Miller wins it with his front roundhouse kick and yeah they're definitely giving Miller quite the push here aren't they? He's definitely improving week by week though that's for sure. Alex Wright comes out and he snatches the microphone from Mean Gene Okerlund. Alex calls Gene Baldy an old midget and he should leave right now because he can't speak German. Alex says the fans are losers just like that British bulldog guy who's sitting in the back shaking like a leaf. Davey didn't answer Alex's challenge on Thunder so Alex wants to give him one more chance tonight on Nitro. Alex is the best wrestler in Europe, he's also better looking than Davey and he's a better dancer so tonight we could see Alex vs Bulldog. That's a big time match guys, can't wait. Next on Raw we've got the Outlaws vs Southern Justice, on Nitro we've got Chavo Guerrero vs Disco Inferno. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Shut up. This one played out like a standard Outlaws match from an in-ring perspective. Badass warms it up, Road Dog shines for a moment but then he needs to get himself out of the ring for the Billy Gun hot tag and Billy cleans house. The layout of Outlaw matches have been the same for a while now but what happens at the end of this match is quite interesting. Jeff Jarrett tried to interfere with his guitar so Jesse James takes it away and Dennis Knight gets whacked. The thing is, Billy was about to win the match anyway and Road Dog just gave Southern Cyborg Justice an easy win on Raw. 
Billy isn't happy about it. He argues with James until X Pac comes down. Billy then accidentally pokes X Pac in his dodgy Scotty Riggs eye, and Pac goes down. Billy decides to get out of the ring where China and Triple H are waiting. Yeah, Triple H is in a wheelchair now. He suffered a knee injury and he won't be in action for a while. Billy just seems tired of carrying the workload at the moment and he's tired of his DX teammates. So he walks away from the faction and everyone's left wondering what's going to happen to the tag team champions. So this was supposed to be the first of two cruiserweight contender matches, Disco vs Chavo and later on we were supposed to have Kaz Hayashi vs Juventud Guerrera, but the Juvie match doesn't happen, god knows what's going on right now regarding the number one contender for the cruiserweight belt. Chavo's hip toss counter is great at the opening bell, as is his arm drag takedown that follows. Disco replies with a sidewalk slam and Chavo begs Disco not to break poor Pepe in half. Guerrero runs at the Inferno with a Lufez press and Disco thinks he's safe on the outside. Chavo performs a plancha, Disco gets wiped out and Chavo takes Pepe for a ride while Disco Inferno gets his wits about him. We see an atomic drop followed by a clothesline and Disco replies with a corner back elbow. The Inferno then delivers a second rope elbow drop but Chavo comes back with a forearm smash in the corner followed by a springboard bulldog. The referee is forced to pull Chavo away from Disco and this gives Disco the chance to hit his opponent with Pepe and secure himself a pinfall victory. Juventud Guerrera comes out to complain. He really should have minded his own business though because while Hoovy's successful in getting Disco out of the ring, he wasn't prepared for Disco coming back in and attacking from behind. Disco plants Hoovy with a pile driver and the Inferno leaves the ring before Chavo can get hold of him. Not a very good match in comparison to Disco's effort last week if I'm honest, but it was still okay. Next on Raw we've got Dan Severn vs Owen Hart in a submission match while the four horsemen have a few things to say on Nitro. Remember, Severn turned his back on Owen at Summerslam so Owen's out for a little revenge. Dan performs a belly to belly and he and Owen almost fall out of the ring after a takedown attempt. Owen's not going to get bullied by Dan and the Blackheart gives as good as he gets, but Dan puts Owen down again quite easily with another belly to belly suplex. The Beast then delivers a running power slam, Owen comes back with a spinning wheel kick and a belly to belly of his own. Owen then tries to put Dan away but Severn goes for his dragon sleeper which would normally end a match but not this week folks. Owen counters, he delivers the exact same pile driver that put Austin on the bench in 1997 and Dan Severn isn't moving. The match gets called off as Dan lies there motionless and things don't look so good for Dan the man right now. This was always scripted by the way, the pile driver injury was supposed to be part of the match, but Severn revealed in an interview that Owen actually did drop him on his head here and Dan felt that bolt of lightning go through his body when he got dropped. In short, Dan Severn dodged a bullet here, it's a small miracle that he didn't get injured the same way Steve Austin did, and backstage Severn ripped into Owen for being too careless. Check out the WSI Dan Severn interview on YouTube to hear Dan talk about this. But that's how the match ends, there's no winner and Dan Severn's left in a bad way. A storyline is going to develop out of this and most of you will know what that storyline is. As soon as Ric Flair begins to speak on Nitro, Eric Bischoff walks to the ring with Stevie Ray, Doug Dillinger and a few security officers. On Thunder, Arn Anderson attacks Stevie Ray with a tire iron and seeing as no one wants to hear what Ric Flair and the Horsemen have to say anyway, Eric Bischoff wants every single member of the group arrested with Anderson getting charged with assault. There's nothing the Horsemen can do, Eric says the boys in prison are going to love Big Mongo as the group get escorted back up the ramp. And Eric also says that Flair used his 10 year old son Reed as an excuse not to show up for work. The crowd aren't happy at all, everyone was expecting to hear from Ric Flair but not this week unfortunately. There is not going to be any horseman business tonight on Nitro. 
We have got Al Snow vs Vader next on Raw. On Nitro, it's Chris Jericho vs Bill Goldberg. Commissioner Slaughter comes to the ring with Vader. Clearly, he plans on getting revenge on Al Snow. Al gets overpowered at the opening bell and he takes a few headbutts from the man they call Vader. A clothesline then floors Snow, and Vader tries to work over the knee for a bit when the action goes to the mat. Slaughter watches on as Vader performs a belly to belly suplex, and when a few clotheslines have no effect on the big man, Snow decides to stomp on Vader's toes before putting Vader down with one last lariat. Al then tries to slam his opponent but he can't do it, so he gets knocked down again and Vader goes for the kill. Snow, however, manages to come back with an enziguri and he was just about to win the match, but Slaughter pulls Al away from Vader and now Al Snow's pissed. Snow grabs head and he's about to whack Slaughter but Vader intervenes. The ref ends up distracted by the commissioner though and this allows Al to hit Vader with head and Al Snow wins via pinfall. Nothing special really. After the bout we see Billy Gunn leaving the arena. He's got his bags, he's got his tag team belt, he didn't bother getting changed but still he's on his way home. Chris Jericho walks to the ring with Rolfus, the Jericho-holic ninja and a new member of Jericho personal security. Jericho's wearing a shirt that says Jericho 1 and Goldberg 0, seeing as Chris beat Goldberg at Fall Brawl, kinda. He wants to make it 2-0 tonight though. Goldberg's music plays in the arena, and it appears that Chris wanted to use the mini Goldberg again tonight on Nitro, but Goldberg's already dealt with that little shit. Jericho sacrifices two of his security men while he and Rolfus get out of the ring. Goldberg performs a double spear in Jackhammer, and that's how it ends. I'll do a quick check in on the undefeated streak here because Goldberg hasn't wrestled in a while and it's best to get up to date now so we're not covering a ton of matches next time. Since his last Nitro match against Sting, Goldberg wrestled 3 matches. He faced Kenyon on the September 24th episode of Thunder, he won a house show match against the Giant the following night, and the night after that on the 26th he beat Sting again. So right here the streak is at 139 wins and O. Oh, the commentators don't make any mention of the WCW count. A six man four corner elimination match takes place on Raw next. On Nitro, DDP cuts a promo. So, in this Raw match, two men start in the ring while four other men stand at the corners. Tags can be made at any time, although it's not a tag match, and eliminations happen via pinfall, submission, DQ, or count out. It's an elimination match, and the last man standing gets a shot at the European title. Edge and Gangrel start the action off. We've got Mark Merrow, Dilo Draws, and Jeff Jarrett involved in this one too. Edge kicks it off with a Slam, but his follow up crossbody misses its target. Gangrel, meanwhile, misses an elbow drop when he slips off the second rope. This allows Edge to capture Gangrel with a Mahistral Cradle and the vampire gets eliminated. If it's that easy, what's the point in Edge and Gangrel continuing this rivalry? Dilo comes in next, he takes a DDT and Edge tags in Draws. Draws hits a jumping clothesline followed by a big old power slam, so Dilo tags in Double J and Jared clearly doesn't want to get involved. Draws suplexes Jared into the ring but Double J fires back with a front Russian leg sweep, soon to be known as The Stroke. Double J then lands a dropkick but Draws gets up and he clotheslines Jared out of the ring. The two then have a fight on the outside and they both get counted out. It's a quick way to eliminate two guys but do you ever notice how the referees count a lot faster in these situations? Marvelous Mark Merrow and Edge get in the ring and Merrow takes control. A Samoan drop puts Edge in the right position for the Marvelocity but Dilo shakes the ring ropes and Mark gets his little wild man smashed on the top turnbuckle. Edge then performs a Hurricane Rana, he covers Merrow and when Dilo tries to hit Edge with a lowdown, Edge moves out of the way and Mero takes all the impact. Edge drop kicks Dilo out of the ring before pinning Mero, and now it's down to two. Edge dives over the top rope and Dilo gets taken out, but then Gangrel comes back with that other dude we saw at breakdown. The distraction allows Dilo to hit the sky high and Dilo becomes the number one contender for the European title. There's something going on with Edge and this newcomer, it's all still a big mystery but the two definitely know each other and Edge gets easily distracted by the newcomer's mere presence. On Nitro, DDP keeps it short and sweet. Mean Gene understands that there's mutual respect between Goldberg and Dallas, but the world title's on the line and there's a big payday involved for the winner of the Halloween Havoc main event. Page says there is respect there, but there's also an incredible competitive nature in both men. 
Page isn't getting in there with a guy he hates like Macho Man Randy Savage or Hollywood scum Hogan. When Page thinks about getting in the ring at the MGM Grand Garden though, he goes to another level. He's getting jacked to the moon. Page says the horsemen are back and it looks like they ain't going anywhere. The wolf pack like to say they're forever while the black and white say it's for life. Page is black and blue. He's DDP. And at Halloween Havoc, I'm going to be for real. Next up on Raw, Vince McMahon begins his WWF Championship presentation. On Nitro, it's Scott Hall vs Billy Kidman. Alright, so this presentation takes up about 20 minutes of Raw's runtime due to entrances and a lot of talking about nothing really, so let me condense it down a bit. I think most of you will remember what happens here anyway, but for those who don't, Vince has brought the winged eagle back and he says it's time to present the bell to a deserving superstar. Vince McMahon introduces The Undertaker and Kane to the ring. The brothers come out separately and Kane's in-ring pyro doesn't go off. <laughs> Vince says both Undertaker and Kane deserve to be WWF Champion. The two men were able to defeat Steve Austin last night at Breakdown. And speaking of Austin, we see Stone Cold arriving backstage in a fucking Zamboni. Austin drives on past security, he wrecks the lighting setup for the backstage promo set, and he drives that thing right into the arena, bumping it against the ring before putting the brakes on. Austin then jumps from the Zamboni into the ring and he targets Vince McMahon. The chairman gets wrecked by Stone Cold and The Undertaker and Kane don't do a thing. The brothers just stand there and watch. The security guys end up handcuffing Austin, but that doesn't stop Stone Cold from still trying to get at McMahon when provoked. The crowd goes nuts as Austin tries his best to get at Vince, but eventually he's brought out of the ring and he laughs when getting brought back up the ramp. Backstage, Austin's put in a police car and McMahon continues to provoke him. There's nothing Stone Cold can do though, and before we go to commercial break, we see Stone Cold getting driven away in the cop car. We come back to the arena and McMahon's in the ring with Undertaker and Kane, and Vince isn't happy at all. Vince says that The Undertaker and Kane didn't live up to their end of this bargain. These two were supposed to protect the chairman, but time and time again, Austin's been able to attack him. So McMahon decides that he isn't going to live up to his end of the bargain either. Neither Kane nor The Undertaker are getting the WWF Championship. Instead, they're going to have to fight for it. At Judgment Day in your house, the next WWF pay-per-view, which I will cover as always by the way, The Undertaker's going to fight Kane whether the brothers want to or not. Not. The special referee's gonna be Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin's gonna be stripped of his dignity when he counts to three and a new champion gets crowned at the pay per view. As for tonight, Undertaker and Kane are getting put in a three on two match. They're gonna face Ken Shamrock, Mankind, and The Rock. Remember too that The Rock won the right to face the champion at Breakdown, so who knows what's gonna happen there. Vince just can't help himself. He takes another jab at the brothers by calling them handicapped. One physically, Kane, and the other mentally, The Undertaker. And The Undertaker says McMahon better watch his ass because the next time he gets out of line, he'll be the one that gets handicapped. Again, Vince just can't help himself. Like a child, he flips Taker and Kane off behind their backs and he gets caught. So Undertaker beats the ever-loving crap out of the chairman and Kane gets in on the action too. Undertaker then focuses on McMahon's knee and ankle. He clearly wants to injure his own boss. And to make sure he succeeds in his mission, the Undertaker ends up dropping the ring steps right across McMahon's ankle. The spot looked excellent and it really looked like McMahon got hit badly. The boss also sold it really well. Backstage, Vince gets put on a stretcher and Mick Foley tries to offer Vince an ice cold drink but Vince declines. Not a great night for the chairman at all. But man, this stuff right here gets replayed a lot when WWE talk about the Monday Night Wars and for good reason too. It was very entertaining with everyone playing their parts really well. Scott Hall and Billy Kidman's an interesting matchup and while it is a match I'm interested in seeing, I also don't want to see Kidman job out after just winning the cruiserweight belt. Scott Hall seems way more focused tonight and even though Vincent's holding his drink, the bad guy isn't allowed to sip unless he wins this match. Nothing like a reward for a hard day's work, right? Scott Hall's survey question this week is, does it taste great or is it less filling? This was from a Miller Lite advertising campaign and Hall thought this was really, really funny. 
Looks like Billy Kidman pressed start to get his alternate colours tonight. He mocks Scott's current issues when Hall throws his toothpick, and Kidman pays for it with a big shove and a ridiculously hard slap across the chest. Kidman then gets tossed to the other side of the ring. This reminds me of Razor Ramon destroying WWF jobbers back in 1993. But Scott wants Vincent to pass him that drink, and this allows Kidman to try a schoolboy pin. When Scott kicks out, he takes a drop kick, and then he's forced to kick out of a crucifix sunset flip. Again, Kidman pays for this defense by taking a hard clothesline, and even Vincent messes Billy around when he gets the chance to do so. Kidman then takes a corner clothesline, he gets choked with Scott's boot, and when Kidman tries to fight back, he takes a choke slam in the middle of the ring. Scott then forgets himself and he mocks the giant, his tag team champion partner. He fixes this little misstep by going to the camera and saying, This one's for you, G Money. But then he goes out for a drink, and this time Vincent can't stop him. Kidman attacks from behind, and Scott spits his drink all over the fans sitting on the front row. In the ring, Kidman builds momentum with a missile dropkick followed by a corner tornado bulldog. He then delivers a crossbody, but Scott kicks out at two. The match comes to an end with Scott performing the fall away slam as Kidman's fire gets put out in record time. He does counter the outsider's edge with a face buster, but Vincent gets on the apron to cause a distraction and Scott's able to go for his finish one more time. Scott wins with the outsider's edge, it was a valiant effort from Billy Kidman, but I do question why you would book Kidman in this match if he was always gonna lose. Saturday White Fever Baby, Big Bratwurst Running Wild Oh, big bratwurst. That's Wunderkind vs Davy Boy on Nitro. On Raw, Mark Henry takes on Farouk. Davy grabs a mic before the match, and just before he falls asleep, he says he has an 11 year old kid and Alex couldn't lace his boots. He then says the fans in Germany love the British Bulldog, and he also says, Put the liquor! That means. Suck it! <laughs> no mate, you'll be slurping on the big broadverse soon enough. A rough lockup sees Davy overpower Alex and Alex is forced to the ropes following a hammerlock. Davy's real confident right now and check it out, b-boy breakdancing British Bulldog, you love to see it. Davy dodges an enziguri and he then applies a surfboard. He then ends up keeping his own shoulders to the mat when trying to pin Alex, so he's still not 100% guys. Davy argues with Billy Silverman and this lets Alex go on offense. Does Wunderkind wails on the British Bulldog before dropping a double axe handle, we then see Alex's vaulting body splash but he only gets a two count. Alex suplexes Bulldog. He then goes to the top rope but Davy wakes up and we see a big slam. The match ends when the ref takes a bump and the crowd actually laugh at the way Billy goes down. It did look a bit comical. Davy hits the power slam but there's no one there to award him the match and here's how it ends. Davy tries to wake up Billy but Alex wakes up and... Charlie thinks Alex won, while Billy thinks it was Davy. Both wrestlers are just too awesome, so no one can really pick a winner here, but Alex still wants to fight. So Dad's Thunderkind and Dad's Bulldog beat the hell out of each other just before Nitro moves on to its next match. If we watch that replay again, both guys actually kicked out before 3, so yeah, neither man won. On Raw, China refereed this match between Farouk and Mark Henry. It still amazes me how WWF had nothing for Farouk to do immediately following the nation, but anyway, it's a very short one here. Farouk tried to get the upper hand early, but Mark overpowers his own later and it goes to the outside. Farouk gets body slammed, he takes a leg drop, and back in the ring, Mark performs a par slam, but China refuses to count the pinfall. What's up with the referees this week? What's going on? Mark then goes for a military press slam, but China hits him with a low blow. She then performs a fast three count and Farouk wins. That's the match and that's all that happened. China then gets served with some legal papers. Our boy here couldn't wait until she got backstage. China opens up the letter, she looks at Mark, she tears the papers up and she walks away. What did the letter say? I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. Backstage, Ken Shamrock gets interviewed and it seems WWF are going to move forward with a Ken Shamrock heel turn. He says he doesn't like Detroit much and he gets a round of booze. He also says he owes everyone involved in tonight's main event a little payback and he's looking forward to getting revenge tonight on Raw. 
Steve Regal, a real man's man, is using a digger outside because that's what real men do. If you've never used a digger before, how can you call yourself a real man's man? The Headbangers are booked to take on the oddities again on Raw, plus the Raw cuts a promo backstage. On Nitro, it's Kevin Nash vs Brian Adams. Knee strikes from Nash, both in the middle of the ring and in the corner. A back elbow gets followed up with a running clothesline, but a second gets countered and Adam hits a diving clothesline. We then see a dropkick from Adams that sends Nash out of the ring, but on the outside, it's Nash doing all the damage. Back in the ring, Brian takes two big boots from Big Sexy, and then Stevie Ray runs down with his trusty slapjack. Nash gets whacked, the ref signals for the bell, and here comes Scott Hall with a drink in his hand. It actually looks like Hall may have turned a page, he pours the drink out and he then starts punching his former best friend. Conan and Lex Luger run down to save Kevin, but the Black and White Express got one up on Big Nosh tonight. The match sucked, but I can't say I had big expectations anyway. On Raw, it's a similar story, the headbangers go up against Kurgan and Golga. Mosh and Thrasher single out Golga, and it fast becomes a story of Kurgan needing to get in there to sort these two bastards out. The headbangers pull off this powerbomb double team move that looked pretty good, but a missed elbow drop from Thrasher gives Golga a chance to tag in the big man. There is zero reaction here, absolutely nothing. It ends with Luna distracting the referee and the ICP get involved by tripping Thrasher up. Kurgan then performs a splash and the oddities win the match. Backstage, Michael Cole wants to interview The Rock but the Great One pushes him away and Rock says, at breakdown he did exactly what he said he was gonna do. He went into the people's cage and he dropped a double people's elbow before hitting a poor jabroni with a rock bottom. Rock's a little confused as to why he has to team up with the guys he beat last night but it's okay because The Rock's the number one contender for the WWF title. Still, it wouldn't matter if Rock was number one contender or not because according to Rocky, nothing in The Rock means nothing compares to being the people's champ. What's next then? X-Pac defending the European title against Val Venus, and Conan and Luger vs Hugh Morris and Barry Darso. Yes, the tag team of Hugh Morris and Barry Darso. Lex performs a shoulder block and an arm ringer before tagging out. Conan hits Darso with a short arm clothesline but Big Barry tags out before hitting Conan with the worst stinger splash ever recorded on video. Hugh Morris misses his follow up corner attack so he takes a rolling clothesline and Jimmy Hart gets punched out too. The tequila sunrise gets broken up by the ever tenacious Barry Darso. Darso pays for his crimes with an axe factor and Lex comes in to score the win with a torture rack while Conan hits Morris with an axe factor and he locks in the tequila sunrise just for the sake of it. After the match, old Flexi Lexi gets a bit confused with his gang signs. What's that? Rock on three, uh, west side four. Jesus, don't leave us hanging, Lex. We didn't get the message at all. Over on Raw, Val Venus comes out with Terry while X Pac comes to the ring with his Scotty Riggs that got dodgy eyeball. The lack of vision causes X Pac to take a shoulder block and a jumping clothesline, but the big Valboski misses a splash and Pac performs his spin kick. Venus fires back with a big boot and a Russian leg sweep, but Waltman puts Venus down after a jump wheel kick. We then see X Pac's jumping clothesline and Venus gets set up for a Bronco Buster, but Terry Runnels trips X Pac up and Val performs a fisherman suplex. Terry made a big mistake here because China ends up coming down the ringside and she shoves Mrs. Runnels to the floor before stalking her around the ring. Val Venus tries to intervene, but X Pac hits him with a baseball slide, and the referee calls for the bell when China attacks Val. It's another DQ finish on Reliving the War. X Pac heads to the back along with China, Venus, and Terry celebrate their victory, but then Goldust music plays in the arena, and the Shattered Dreams graphic gets displayed on the Titan Tron. Glitter falls into the ring as we hear Dustin's voice. He says, Hey Val, I told you he was coming back. Looks like the bizarre one's coming after Val Venus. It'll be interesting to see if it's the old gold dust or a new updated version. We 
We end this week's show with Rock, Shamrock and Mankind vs Kane and Undertaker on Raw. On Nitro, it's Bret Hart vs Hollywood Hogan. Shamrock and Mankind make their entrances first and they start fighting before Rock comes to the ring. When Rock gets in there, all three men start beating the hell out of each other so this team isn't going to work too well it seems. Kane and Taker make their entrance, they manage to separate the Rock from Shamrock and Mankind and the Rock takes a double big boot while Foley and Kenny Boy continue fighting on the outside. Rock's teammates finally go to their corner as The Undertaker performs old school. Kane gets in and he chokes out the people's champ in the corner, but Rocky performs a clothesline and he's able to tag in Mick Foley. Mankind doesn't have much luck against the brothers here. Undertaker and Kane take turns at pulverizing Mrs. Foley's baby boy. So Mankind tags in Ken Shamrock and Shamrock doesn't care much about fighting his opponents. He still wants to give Foley some payback for a chair shot he took at breakdown. So Rock comes in and he floors Shamrock as if to say, yo, focus on the task at hand Kenny boy. Shamrock's lack of focus doesn't help at all when The Undertaker and Kane go after him. The dead man hits him with a back kick and Kane comes in with a clothesline. Shamrock's able to come back with a drop kick followed by a Hurricane Rana though Kane took the Hurricane Rana really well too. In this break gives Shamrock a chance to tag in Foley. Mick pulls off a cannonball from the apron but The Undertaker's right there to put Foley back in his place. Mick takes a bump at the steel steps before getting thrown back in the ring for a top rope clothesline from Kane and when Undertaker tags in, we see The Rock and Ken Shamrock arguing in the corner. Poor Mick gets tossed to the outside where he gets annihilated. He takes another ring step bump. He gets choked with some cord that The Undertaker found lying around and Kane hits him with a steel chair. After all this, he's still able to put Kane down with a swinging neckbreaker, but he's unable to tag out afterwards. Eventually, he's able to hit the double arm DDT though, and Mick tags in Rock. The People's Champ delivers a DDT before hitting The Undertaker with the most electrifying move in sports entertainment. And then, for some reason, The Rock, Mankind and Shamrock begin working together quite well. A few quick tags let the team stay on top of the brothers, and even Mick and Ken seem to be on the same page. Shamrock's able to put The Undertaker in the ankle Lock, though Kane breaks it up. It ends with Rock and Undertaker alone in the ring and it looks like Undertaker thought Rock was going for the float over DDT while Rock thought Undertaker was going for a clothesline. <laughs> Not great was it? But still Rock performs the rock bottom on the dead man and Rock pins the legendary Undertaker on Raw's war. Rock leaves the ring afterwards and it looks like the Undertaker's blaming Kane for this loss. So all is not well with the Brothers of Destruction. Here we go, a match that's been years in the making and a match that just randomly gets announced on Nitro. Bret Hart vs Hollywood Hogan. No need to go into the history here, Bret's made it clear for a long time how he really felt about Hogan. So let's see how WCW booked this. The two shove each other in trash talk before Hogan applies a side headlock. Bret then goes down after a shoulder block and when the two get up Hogan shows he's no sludge when moving from a headlock into a drop toe hold. Bret counters with a hammerlock, the two get up and Bret focuses on the left python brother. And look at this, cross armbar from Hollywood Hogan, what's going on? Hogan stays in control with a clothesline and a body slam, but he misses three elbow drop attempts and Bret clotheslines Hulk out of the ring. The leader of the NWO gets rammed into the ring post before getting back inside the ropes where he begs for mercy, but he manages to toss Bret out of the ring and that's the match pretty much over. The hitman gets dropped on the guardrail twice and he takes all the impact on his injured knee. Hogan then wraps Bret's leg around the ring post and he applies enough pressure to make Hart scream in agony. And back in the ring, Hogan applies a spinning toe hold while Bret holds onto the ring ropes. Bret isn't going to get out of this one, so Sting runs down and he breaks the hold. Members of the Wolfpack come down to tend to Bret, and it looks like Hogan's going to win via referee stoppage. Bret wants to fight, but Luger and Conan stop him. Remember though that Hogan challenged both Bret and Sting earlier on, so Sting takes off his jacket and we get to see main event number two, it's Sting vs Hogan. The crowd fires up when Sting goes on offense. We then go to split screen where we see Bret getting brought up the rampway. The match continues in the ring, but when Bret reaches the ambulance, Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner launch an attack on Lex and Conan. The black and white take out the wolf pack. They don't seem too bothered about Bret, and Steiner lets the hitman hobble away. Back in the arena, Hogan's getting the better of Sting, and he gets the opportunity to go for the leg drop. But 
when Hogan misses, we see Bret Hart walking back down to the ring. Sting pulls off a stinger splash, he sets up a death lock as Bret gets back in the ring, and Bret attacks Sting. A DDT puts the icon down as the referee calls for the bell. So it was all a big setup this whole time, and Bret's still friends with Hogan in NWO Hollywood. Bret ends up putting the sharpshooter on Sting, Hogan tosses him a chair and Bret goes after Sting's knee, and the beatdown stops when Conan and Lex run down the ringside although they are unable to get inside the ropes. Nitro ends with Sting getting pulled out of the ring while Hogan and Hart celebrate. Yeah, that was the much anticipated Bret vs Hogan match. Raw wins reliving the war this week, Austin attacking Vince and the 3 on 2 main event secured it this week. Hard vs Hogan could have been good, but it got WCW'd. That's the best way to say it, it got WCW'd straight to hell. You know the story here and you know the match should have been built up and put on pay per view, but there you have it. We've got 72 points for Raw, 64 points for Nitro, and we've got 17 ties. Nitro bounced back quite well this week with a 4.6 rating, while Raw posted another 4.0. And that's September 1998 in the books. We are approaching the end of the year but we have still got some big matches and big moments coming up. Next week on Raw, Vince McMahon gets a few visitors in hospital including Mr Socko, Dilo gets his shot at the European Championship, and Owen Hart makes a big decision in regards to his career. On Nitro, the Wolfpack look to seek out and destroy NW Hollywood backstage, DDP and Chris Kenyon are booked in a one on one match, and Eddie Guerrero introduces a new faction to WCW audiences. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Reliving the War and take care.